Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Hallelujah. If you remember last week, we left off at a particular place which uh, took us into this, this dynamic verse in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, and I'm going to read to you from verses 1 through 7 so that we can get the context. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Every one of us, every one of you adults, every one of you kids has a calling from God. Every one of you little ones called by God. And we need to walk worthy of the calling. The Bible then says in verse 3, You're endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, on that context and in that context, let's listen to verse 8. Therefore he says... When he led, ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the, the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Hallelujah. Are you a thing? You're, you're, a, you're a thing this morning. Guess what? God has filled you, thing. <laughs> God has filled you. Hallelujah. Now, for you to walk worthy of the calling, for you to bear with one another in love, for you to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, to be united in one body, one Spirit, and one hope of our calling, to understand one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, and to walk in the grace given according to Christ's gift, we must understand verses 8 through 10. We must understand the resurrection, the death, the descension, the, and the ascension, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Therefore, he, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But, for, but that he first descended to the lowest parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, does anybody know? Kids, do you know what he said, what Jesus said when he died on the cross? Some of the last words Jesus said, it is finished. Very good. When Jesus said that, he was not declaring that there was nothing left to do. He was declaring a completion and a finished and complete and total work on the cross concerning the sacrificial system that there would no longer have to be, that He would be the last sacrifice, the one and only total and complete sacrifice, that the cross and the blood that was shed would be a complete finishing work of all that those sacrifices and, and what had separated us from sin had meant. But there were still some things that Jesus had to do. In fact, there's still some things from this point on that Jesus has to do. If we read the book of Revelation, we see there are, there are a number of things yet to be outworked. Jesus has yet to come again. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, he said it's finished, but he was declaring concerning the, sac the sacrifices. Jesus had become sin, all of it, for everyone. Okay, how many of you kids can say this? Jesus became... Come on, kids. I want the kids to say this. Jesus became all of sin for everybody. Amen. Praise God. Out of the mouths of infants and babes. The totality of sin that had been conferred upon Jesus, all that He had become. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin was made to be sin. He didn't do sin, but He became sin that we could become His righteousness. Now, now, the truth of the matter is that the wages of sin is death. That's true. Jesus did not get a special circumstance when He died. He became sin that qualified Him to die. When Jesus died, He didn't get a special uh, 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 
a, a special uh, out, a special rule, a, a special circumstance or exception to the rule. Jesus died as sin and as anyone else who died in sin would have died. We've got to understand this because we, we understand that when, the whole point of the incarnation is that Jesus could replace us, could become us to replace us and be punished for our sin. So when Jesus died on the cross, he died as a man. He died in, in sin, not because he'd done sin, remember, but he became sin and he suffered the judgment of all sin. He didn't just suffer the physical judgment of sin, he had to ju suffer the entire judgment of sin. This is very important for us to understand because, because in recent years, in, in some of the modern preaching of some of the modern mentality of Christianity, which really this has only existed in, in, in say, the last hundred or maybe two hundred years. But before that, there was a, a, a deep understanding of what took place between the cross and the throne. But people have become squirmish and not wanted to really consider the full depth of what Jesus did. If we, if we look at the Apostles' Creed, we see certain statements which have been left out in some people's theologies because they don't want to really gr come to grips with the weight of what happened on the cross and after the cross. The Bible says that it, G, the one who ascended first had to descend. Now it didn't say just descend to the earth, that would have meant his incarnation, but descend into the lower parts of the earth. That means something completely different. To understand this, we need to look at a particular scripture that Jesus described and, and talked about concerning paradise and Hades. Because this is a descriptive both of paradise and Hades, and specifically Hades or hell, that Jesus from the cross had to undergo for you. I am so glad that Jesus did not just pay for my physical death. Because that would make me healed, but it wouldn't make me able to go to heaven. I had, to, I had to be saved spiritually, not just physically. And so Jesus had to die for me spiritually and not just physically. It was a complete and total work. And so in Luke chapter 16, Jesus gave a story, a true story. Not just a parable, not just a metaphor, but a true story. Now we know this because Greek scholars tell us that when Jesus said a certain person or a certain man, he was referring to a true story. That's the, the cultural way of saying, hey, this is true, this actually happened. And so Luke chapter 16 verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine little linen and said, fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and, ca and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades... He lifted up his eyes and saw Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may... He's still trying to tell Lazarus what to do, by the way. <laughs> tell, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Well, that's very descriptive of what Hades is like. It's a place of torment. It's a place of burning. It is, it is a place of the separation of the presence of God. Verse 25, but Abram said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your th good things, likewise Lazarus evil, evil things, but he is now comforted and you're tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that, so that those who want to pass from here to, to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Now Jesus is giving an account of a true story. This is actually a conversation that happened between Abram and this man. This, this man that is in hell. In verse 27, then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send to him my, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abram said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And so we have this story that Jesus told, a true story, a certain man, in a certain scenario of both of them dying in one night, 
both in being in separate places, Hades and paradise. This is not just a, a, a fairy story, folks. This is truth. This is actually what happened. There's much we could talk about there, but, but I want you to understand one thing. Hades, or this, this manifestation of hell, is not the final hell. It is not the hellfire of eternal damnation that Satan and his angels will be locked up in after the thousand year rule of reign in Christ on there. This is not that final hell that there is no, you know, that, that's, that's not this. This, is a, this was a temporary manifestation of hell, of a separation, of a burning place, a separate place. It was a temporary place, a place that one day those that, are, that were there will, will, will be in the final hell. Luke 24, 25 through 27 says, He said to them, O foolish ones, O slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things uh, to enter his, into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded them all the scriptures and the things concerning him. So Jesus on the road after his resurrection explained from Moses and the prophets all of these things. Well, Abraham said to the rich man, They have Moses and the prophets using the same terminology, the same scriptures. What had happened is a lot of people in Israel had believed in God, had believed in His Torah, His Word, had believed in the coming Messiah, and when they died in their righteousness because of their faith, just like Abraham, had gone to Abraham's bosom. Abraham being, being, being that one there to welcome them. But those who had rejected the Word of God and rejected the coming Messiah went to a place called Hades, a, a place of torment, a place of separation, not of God's choosing but of their own through rejecting what was available to them. Paradise, on the other extreme, the other place, is also not a final place. It's not heaven. It's not the final heaven. Both of these places are described. Nobody, now listen to this, nobody, nobody was able to go to heaven until after the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus giving this story about a certain man in this situation where Abraham was, was not in heaven. He was in a place called paradise, also a temporal place holding place for those who were righteous, for those who, were, who had believed God. The bonds of sin and death had to be broken and a new creation where, where one God, one Father of all, who is all, above all and through all and in you all could be in relationship with man again. The cross and the blood of Jesus closed the pages on the old covenant. Now I want you to understand something. The, the blood which covered people within the old covenant was a temporal covering, a temporal release, a temporal relief from sin. But the blood of Jesus, once and for all, obliterated sin. Dealt with it completely. We've not been washed uh, in a temporal way. We've not just been covered by the grace of God. We sin has been defeated. Hallelujah. We have been washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. That's the incarnation. Verse, chapter 10, verse 9 says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. But by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many? Once for all. Hallelujah. Once for all. So what is paradise waiting for? What was paradise waiting for? It was waiting for the firstborn from the dead. Even in paradise, they were waiting for the resurrection of Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were looking on, waiting for the resurrection of the one that they had seen and known in the gospel that they understood. They'd have to wait at the, after the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Even paradise would have to wait three excruciating days and nights as Jesus, from his death on the cross, plummeted into hell for the, for the judgment of all sin. Jesus had to die spiritually for all the judgment of sin. Now, again, like I said, it seems of recent years people have been squirmish and wanted to move away from that and thought that this was a controversial subject, but apparently not so to the Apostle Peter at the very first preaching of the gospel message. 
the very central theme of the very first gospel message, which, by the way, led 3,000 people to Christ, so I would say that's a fairly good message. What was the central theme? Well, let's have a look at it. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And you're going to see why this is so important in just a moment. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Jesus, uh, sorry, Peter talking about Jesus and, and giving a, a, some context with David's prophecy. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands of crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul where? In Hades. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your, in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore... Being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to, to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on, the, on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, in hell. Nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, which we are all witnesses. Isn't that amazing? The very central theme of the first gospel message that was preached to the Jews on the streets of Jerusalem was that Jesus went to hell, but God didn't leave him there. God raised him up from there. Hallelujah. Well, Romans 10 declares something to us concerning our salvation. Look at Romans 10, 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Now listen to the context. It's really interesting. Do not say in your heart who will... Ascend into heaven. Here we go again. Same context. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will, what? Descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that what? God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. There's no context of dead outside dead. <laughs> dead is dead. And you went to hell or you went to paradise. And that is the context of death. So God didn't raise Jesus from a third category. Understand this now. Why is this important? Why? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, too many people stop when they preach the gospel right there. Just confess Jesus is Lord. No, that's only half of it. There's a dynamic that is absolutely crucial to a person's salvation. What? That you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That means the gospel message must include the resurrection of Christ. And it must include the depths to which Jesus had to go to be resurrected from because of where we would have gone and we've been resurrected from. Notice that the ascension and the dissension of Jesus is brought up here in this context, even in Romans chapter 10. You only have to look, as I said earlier, at the Apostles' Creed, some of the early confessions of the, of the fathers of our faith. Going way back, one of the, one of the lines, and, and most modern churches don't have an understanding of the Apostles' Creed, but right here, let me just take a little snippet. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He had descended to hell. The third day rose again from the dead, and he ascended to heaven. That is, a, that is the dynamic of what was believed from the earliest days of the church. We can't let that go. We can't let it go to be watered down into a loosey-goosey gospel if you just, you know, just say, well, yeah, I mean, you, know, you can just add Jesus to you. No, you cannot. He's got to be Lord. If He's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. Hallelujah. So the one confusion that people have with this thought, though, is, and, and, and forgive me for 
for being uh, funny with this, but this is what people say, and I, I hear this so oftentimes when I talk about this to young people, because I teach young people this. I teach the YWAMers this when I go into the schools, and, and they've never heard anything like this, that Jesus went to hell. And there's always one person, I'm waiting for it, I'm wa as I'm doing this, I'm waiting for it. But didn't the thief on the cross say to Jesus, today I'll be with you in paradise? <laughs> And I, I'm saying it in a funny voice because it's, it's all, somebody always sort of sheepishly kind of says that to me. And, 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 and you've got to understand that, that there, yes, he, he said that. Let's just bring that verse up if we can. Luke 23, verse 43. Now, I want you to see something here in this context. I want you to understand something about Greek and Hebrew. There is no punctuation. This, this one verse by itself... This one verse, is this, this is the only verse that challenges to any context that thought of Jesus. And the only reason that this context has been brought about in recent years is because the English-speaking world has predominantly preached the gospel. But before that, before the English-speaking world was the predominant language, people were reading it from the Greek and the Latin and, the, and other contexts, and they had no problem because the punctuation didn't confuse things. In our English translations, to the, to the translator's uh, own thoughts and, th and thinking, they've popped in a, a, translate, a, a comma there, and Jesus said to him, uh, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let me put it to you, take the comma out, and it now becomes biblical. It now becomes contextual to the rest of the Bible. Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. The moment you take the comma out, which doesn't even exist in the, in the original grammar, it now lines up with the rest of scriptures. Just wanted to deal, that, deal with that for you, just in case you were, you were wondering. <laughs> Why would we contradict what the apostles in the New Testament teach because of one comma? Remove this and everything lines up as it should. Now, also now, notice this. Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. Nowhere in the scripture does it tell us that Jesus was able to raise himself from the dead. Jesus was held captive under punishment and judgment. But after three days and three nights, the Bible says in, in, in Peter's message in Acts, God raised Jesus from the dead. In Romans 8.11 it says the same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead. And also in Romans it says, the glory of the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, which none of the rulers of this age knew had they, had they had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Woo! Glory! Had, they didn't know what was happening on the cross. They didn't know what was happening for three days and three nights. They didn't understand all that was taking place. But after three days, oh, uh, uh, Celia mentioned earlier in, in, in the prayer uh, at the beginning of the service, she, she mentioned there would have been a noise. Oh my goodness, there would have been a rumbling. There would have been an, a, a sound and a, the whole place would have, was affected by the firstborn from the dead. You know, there's often noise at childbirth. Huh. And there's birth pangs, and, and, and there's, the, you know, and then there's, there's that, ho that whole intensity and everything else. And, but I'm telling you, there, and there is a, usually a shout that that, that, brought, that baby is born with. All of heaven shouted, I can tell you. All of hell screamed in that moment, I can tell you. Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, now get this. I want you to understand. Now, kids, think about this. Jesus has just stepped out of the grave. He's just been resurrected from the dead. And there's Mary. And, and I, I always get the image like this, that Mary sees Jesus. You know, he, first of all, she thinks he's a gardener and so forth. And he says, Mary, he calls her name. And I see Mary, or it's like a, in a cartoon. I see her mid, like flying towards Jesus, just to, you know, wrap his arms. Jesus! And Jesus goes, whoa! And I see Mary kind of mid-air. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? You know, and, and Jesus, basically, he says, look, he says, do not cling to me. Touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. He said, don't touch me yet. I haven't finished. 
Now, I've finished a certain amount. I've finished the sacrificial on the cross, but there's something I've got to do. I've got to ascend. You can't touch me right now. I mean, literally, literally, he's on his way to heaven. He's on his way into the heavenly holy of holies, and he sees Mary, and his heart just goes out, and he says, i just got to say hi. Hi, but don't touch me. <laughs> and Mary goes back because the, the disciples don't believe her. She tries to tell him. Jesus later on touches. See, and he, so, so why no touchy? Why, why no cuddle? Why, no, why none? He's just about to take his blood into the holy of holies. And if you understand anything about that, that moment, there can be no sin, no stain. He, Mary cannot touch him. And so Jesus ascends. Now, if you want to read this out, we go into Hebrews chapter 9 and, and all the way through. And, and in verse 22, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copy of the things in the heavenlies should be purif purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands where are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Jesus went into the heavenly holy of holies himself with his own blood. Uh, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the most holy place every year with the bl with blood of another, then he would have to have suffered then since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice. Now if you study through that 9, 10, 11 Hebrews, you'll understand the system and what took place in the cleansing of the heavenly utensils that Jesus had to do with his own blood. That, was, that, was, that had to be completed before anybody can touch him. Now we see an interesting situation. Jesus shows up amongst the disciples and he says to Thomas, Oh, bless Thomas. <laughs> but I was listening to Brother Copeland the other day and he said, Bless Thomas, at least he was consistent. He consistently believed nothing. You know. <laughs> but Jesus says, Okay, buddy, come on, you can touch me now. Put your hand in my side, touch... I don't know, but he left his scars just, just for Thomas, you know, just to prove. I, I think if Jesus had shown up without scars, you know what Thomas would have said? It's not you. I saw the nails. But Jesus said, no, here, look, look at those holes. Look at my sign where the spear pierced. What's their response? My Lord, my God. Glory. Now, it's interesting what Jesus says there in Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. Now they can touch him. For a spirit does not, now listen, flesh and bones, as you see. What's missing? No mention of blood. The blood was poured out. The blood was the offering. We refer to ourselves as flesh and blood, but Jesus in this instant did not refer to himself as flesh and blood. He referred to himself as flesh and bones. Bones, what's flowing through his, blood, his veins now is glory. I'm telling you the glory of God is flowing through him. Hallelujah. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. That's what he did at the ascension. That first place into the Holy of Holies before he finally went to the throne room to sit down. John 20, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples had assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So they said to him again, he said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. It was interesting. This is the verse that our Amy popped through on a message just a little bit earlier. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, let's understand this. Romans 10 says that our salvation is at what point? You believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. You confession with your mouth that he is Lord. And at that point, the washing and the regeneration of the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, can now take place and bring you into salvation. At this point, Jesus breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit and at their confession of His Lordship and their believing of Him being raised from the dead and after He has now cleansed the heavenlies, they are now able to receive their salvation. Now, they're not empowered for works of ministry yet. They've still got to hang around for a bunch of time and wait for something else. After Jesus ascended into heaven, 
He said that, he said that power is going to come upon you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And so in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were seated. And there appeared upon them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I'm telling you. Jesus rose up from that point. The last time he spoke to his disciples on that Mount of, Trans of uh, Ascension, he stood there and he went up and he was received into a cloud. I have a suspicion that that wasn't just a natural cloud. The Bible tells us that there is a great cloud of witnesses. I'm telling you, he was received up into that way and he will come again in the same, with the same cloud, with the saints following him. Hallelujah. And I believe I'm going to be in that number. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God. And so now the resurrected Lord of glory has ascended into heaven and he has sat down at the right hand of the Father. And because you are now in him, when you, when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you sit down on the same throne, in the same seat with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there is a, there is a commission that is there for us. That great commission that Jesus left us with. He spoke it to people who had been born again, made brand new creations. And yet he told them, you wait. You wait now to be my witnesses. There's something to come upon you. There's a power from on high to come upon you. Why? Because the power that Jesus walked and talked on the earth in his incarnate form is the same power that He sent from heaven to come upon you now. It's that resurrection power. It's that anointing. It's what He walked with and talked with, but finally, through His resurrected form, He was able to go to heaven and send that same Holy Spirit upon you and upon me. And now with the resurrection life in us and the power of the Holy Spirit upon us, I'm telling you, if God is for us, no, who can be against us? I'm telling you, with the, whole, with the resurrection power in you and the Holy Ghost upon you, there is nothing that you cannot do that God has called you to do. There is no one that you can cannot get through to. There is no way. I mean, I'm telling you. I am telling you. The Bible says that to look up. Don't now say it's another four months till harvest. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. If any of you read my little message that I sent out this week, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up because that would depress me if I, if I didn't get many hands. But if any of you read what I said, I want you to understand it. Jesus, in verse 35 of chapter 4 of John, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are, they are ready and white for harvest. And he who reaps wages, now listen, and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that, sh that, that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. There is a great cloud of witnesses. You know what? There are saints that have sowed their lives and their faith and their prayers into Zilmir. There are saints that have gone before us around the world who have given their lives for the gospel. Some of those saints died in environments and places that they never saw one person receive Christ. But they sowed their blood. They sowed that gospel. And that my Bible says, whatsoever a man sows that, he shall also reap. Now, that, now, they've gone to heaven so they can't physically reap it, but they can rejoice with us in the, in the commission as we reap that harvest. And that's why we've still got to go into every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. And that means, and you know what? These days, you can do that in Zilmir just about. It's just about every nation, every tribe, and every tongue within a, about a 10-mile radius. But there are those, I know this, and some of you prayers have seen this in the Spirit, 
That there are, there are times when we gather together as church that that great cloud of witnesses is peering over the grandstands of heaven. Do you know one of the reasons why? One of the reasons they're excited? Because they just got a promise from Jesus that they would rejoice with us. That they would not be made perfect apart from us. And so they're looking forward to us finishing the job so that they can, we can join. We get to celebrate this together. Hallelujah. So from the first saint that received Jesus in that room when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, to the last before the Lord comes triumphantly, I'm telling you, we've got our job to do. And this day, this resurrection day, this is the very center, the very dynamic, the very basis of everything we believe, everything that saved us, and everything that's commissioned us to do what God's called us to do. Amen.